Okay. ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם, אשר קידש לנו במזוותיו וציוונו לעסוק בדברי תורה. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandment, and has commanded us to be engaged with the words of Torah. O Lord our God, we ask that you make the words of your Torah sweet in our mouth, and in the mouth of your entire people, the house of Israel. May we, our descendants, and the descendants of your people, the house of greater Israel, know your name and study your Torah for its own sake. Blessed are you, O Lord, who teaches Torah to his people in Israel. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all the people, gave to us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, who gives the Torah. So, last week, I talked about the book of Numbers as a litany of complaints that Paul said we need to learn from them. We, today, in our generation, need to learn from them. Last week, the complaint was about the heavenly food that Hashem provided for them in the desert. This week, the complaint is about the promised land itself, the land of promise, the land of which Hashem said, this is a good land. Complaining is really a sickness, you know. In Numbers 13, and if you want to look at your Bibles on your phone, we can uh, relax the uh, 11th commandment, if your Bible is on your phone. In Numbers 13, 1 through 3, we read, uh, it's, I'm reading from the ESV. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, everyone a chief among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the people of Israel. They were leaders. They were leaders. Leadership is, was very important. Much, I, I would say much more crucial. Integrity and leadership was much more crucial then and now. Today we, we all can read, we can verify information. We can challenge our leaders. Because we can, you know. But in those days, only the leader knew the information. So the, a leader was really important. He led the people. He could make the people go the right direction or not. Those were all leaders who went to scout the land. And we know the story. They went and they came back with an evil report deprecating the land, saying, it's not good. Oh, boy. Hashem said, it's a good land. But the scouts come back and say, it's not a good land. Now, of course it's a good land, but we can't take it. To go against Hashem's command, Hashem said, it's a good land, and you shall take it. To go, to go against Hashem's command was their sin. Now, we read this story and we say, oh, them spies. <clears throat> Come on, how could they? I really find it amazing that 
whenever we read Bible stories, let's say Bible stories, yeah, we tend to put ourselves in the shoes of the good guys. We, we associate ourselves with the people who did the right thing. We, we read about, for example, about the Christians in Germany and France who stayed silent during the Holocaust. We said, how, how could they? For sure, I would have done something if I would have been there. I would have been like Bonhoeffer, who challenged the Nazi party. Cory Ten Boom. Cory Ten Boom. I would have been like Oscar Schindler. But the Bonhoeffers, the Cory Ten Booms, and the Schindlers are few and far between. It's the same with the story of our scouts in Numbers 13. We may think, surely we would have been like Joshua and Caleb who returned with faith to go to war against these people who made them feel like grasshoppers. But again, the Joshuas and the Calebs are few and far between. <coughs> Yeshua actually warns his own generation uh, about that kind of attitude. The history of the prophets of Israel is recorded in the Tanakh. It's a story, it's a history of persecution and martyrdom by the people that were trying to save. A prophet's glory is generally posthumous after death. They are recognized as great after they die. It's actually easier to agree with the people who are trying to tell the truth after they're dead. When they're alive, we have a hard time saying, yes, you're right. Oh, God, it's so hard. But to their days, they say, ah, yes, they were so great. It's less humbling. When they're dead, we know they do not feel the satisfaction of having been right. It's easier on our pride. Yeshua warns his own generation in Matthew 23, 29 and 30, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the two. Oh, need the key. Voila. And the key is. We'll have to two. Me too. <laughs> I didn't see him. Okay. So in Matthew 23, 30, 29 to 30, uh, Yeshua, Yeshua tells people, tells the Pharisees who were challenging him, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. That's what I was saying. We would have been part of the good guys. You know, but uh, it, it's a natural thing when we read history, we put ourselves in, in the shoes of the good guys. So as a result of of that attitude, the ten scouts come back and get a bad rap. But the question is, would we have been there? You know, and here we're 
somebody introduced in the camp and we hear the scouts coming back. Oh, you know, this land is great. Yeah, but there are giants there. Forget that. They just have two wars with the giant king. And they won. Another one. Now they see lots of giants. And the people are told, you know, somehow they're, they're the ones with the information. So they come and 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 tell the people that we, would we have been there? Would we have been part of a? Uh, if we would have been the scouting team, sorry, would we have come back like Joshua and Caleb, or like the two other ones? You know, I think it's an honest question. In which camp would we have been? You know, and then let's say we're in the in the part of the population, would we have believed Joshua and Caleb? All the, ten, all the scouts. I mean, Joshua and Caleb, they come on. Joshua is, is, is Moses' pet anyway. Whatever Moses does, he does. Oh. You know, so he's his favorite. You know, so uh, we can't really believe what he says. So, you know, it's kind of difficult. So, <clears throat> a rabbi once said, and I did forget his name, he said, we should never criticize others about a sin if we cannot find the same sin within ourselves. It's a big thing in Judaism. If a judge is presented with a case, the first thing he's supposed to do is to decide, am I a fit judge for that case? If he's got, if there's any interests, he's not fit. If, if it's somebody from his family, he's not fit because he might be biased. If there's any political, economic thing, he's not fit. Uh, he's got to decide if he's fit. And one of the point of fitness for a judge, a rabbi says, is that we are not fit to judge somebody else's weakness unless we can find the same weakness within ourselves. That's the only way we our judgment can be balanced with mercy and compassion. When we know how easy it is to fall into that same temptation. It's really important. Uh, it's the only way our judgment can be mixed with empathy and mercy, not rigid, legalistic self-righteousness. Our Master Yeshua is the prime example of that. We do read in John, John 5.22, that Hashem entrusted him with all judgment. So, so we can safely say he's a fit judge. If God says he's a good judge, we're not going to do the same thing. He's a good judge. No, he's not. We're not going to do the same thing. God says he's good. He has entrusted him with all judgment. So we know that he's established with that, but there's one thing that Yeshua did is that though he was, I use the word raised, in the halls of heaven, he came down here to put on the flesh of our sinful reality so that, as it says, he would be tempted in every sin even as we are. So basically, He's able to find our sin into himself. He touched the leper. He did all kinds of things. You know, it says, uh, it says, he was tempted in all things, even as we are. Tonight, the the Brit says that. So, since every sin can he can find every sin in his own self, then he's fit to judge us. That's really important. He didn't judge us from above. Oh, no, no, no. Came down 
to live our lives in our same reality. So to really, now to come back to our spies, to really understand what happened with those spies, to really draw a proper conclusion about their mistake, we need to be able to internalize their fault within ourselves. If not, we can't say nothing about them, we can't say anything. What was that fault? Was it lack of faith? Was it disobedience? Was it fear? Was it pride? <laughs> was it battle fatigue? All those would be legitimate, you know. Was it disappointment that uh, the land was already occupied, that they were going to have to fight to go in? The same thing that happened to Abraham, actually. He leaves her and he comes. Oh, somebody lives there already. Every one of us can have their own ideas of what happened to them. You know, all would be right, probably. But I'd like to propose one. Um, they were victims of self-deprecation. I'll use a different word later. Paul teaches us, Paul teaches us that we should be humble. In Philippians 2, 3, he says, do nothing out of rivalry or vanity, but in humility, regard each other as better than yourself. You know, humility is a real hallmark of the disciple, the believer. But whereas humility is a healthy behavior to own, we should never own it at the cost of deprecating our own value in the sight of God. Here's what the spies say in Numbers 13, 33. They say, we saw the Nephilim out there, the descendant of Anak. The word Anak in Hebrew today still means giant who was from the Nephilim. <clears throat> so they're, they knew that story from Noah and stuff. We saw the Nephilim. And to ourselves, we looked like grasshoppers. By comparison, and we looked that way to them too. So they said, to ourselves, when we saw them, oh, I feel like a grasshopper. And we looked like that to them too. Now, you know, when you read that there was a map in the text in Joshua 2, there's, uh, no, in uh, Numbers 13, there was a, a map of where the, the, they tell us the city where they went. And let's say Israel, I have Israel here. On this side is the Mediterranean Sea. On this side is the Jordan River, okay? So I didn't want to bother making slides. <laughs> so... And they were here in the desert, Sinai Desert. They went up, parallel the Jordan River, all the way up to the north, to, to what would be called today Lebanon. And they went down, closer, uh, paralleling the Mediterranean Sea. Not close to it, but on the western side, they came down. You know, there's some very famous roads there. So they came down and they came close to what's called today the Gaza Strip. Um, the Gaza Strip was inhabited by a people called the Philistines. Now, Semitic people are generally short. It's a short race. <laughs> For example. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the Philistines were not Semitic. They were not Semitic. The, the Philistines 
actually came from Greece, from Crete. They were closer to Greece. They were co closer to the Westerners, who were a taller race. Okay? A taller race. Like, you know, I stand beside Garrett, you know, if it, ah! in the big one. <laughs> You feel like a grasshopper. Yeah, if you look at grasshopper. <laughs> so the Philistines, they say they were uh, they were kind of a, you know, it's all a, a, a come on, it's all a, a educated guesses, you know. They were a mix with uh, with with Western with the Greeks, so mixed with J path. So, and a, a mix of Shem and Jephthah. So they 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 went. Oh no no, a, a mix uh, Shem or Jephthah. Yes, they were. It was more from the gene pool of of the West of Jephthah. So they were taller. So, uh, but even so, for. To feel like this, to say we look like grasshoppers, that's mighty tall. <laughs> that's mighty tall. So I know that when we read Bible, when we read text in Semitic culture, language, and literature, uses a lot of hyperboles, exaggerations. It's very, very. Uh, the Bible is full of. Hyperbole. So, me, I like to read the text literally, but in a pragmatic way. So, I'd like to propose that since they came back that way, that race of people was much taller. And it scared them. You know, uh, it says there were people who came from Crete, from the Bronze, in the Bronze Age. So the people might have been impressed by their stature and got scared. So it's not that like one king who is a giant and the rest of the people are like that. It's like everybody is like that. You know. So they get scared, return with an evil people. There might also have been the sons of Anak, some giant. Whichever. Maybe they were just quite tall people and they looked at us and said, oh, we can't fight them. You know, they were an organized people. And, and you know, it's like, you got to see, maybe they, they got to talk be, with each other. And sometimes when we talk, the fish gets bigger. Oh, I caught a fish last nice. week. It was like that. <laughs> you know, and... Uh, Fear may be mixed into it. Whatever happened, they were not comfortable. We didn't need glasses. But. Yeah, you know, you know, they needed glasses of faith. You know, so whether it was something that was genetic or something because they were tall people, or whether they were really all giants, in any case, in any case, Hashem had said, the land is good, and you got to go and take it. So when Hashem says jump, we say, how high? When Hashem says conquer the land, we say, okay, when? We're sharpening our soul already. You know? Modern Israel has been a very good example of that. When you read stories about the first war in 48, right after the independence, declaration of independence, you scratch your head, you want to have it on that. Five, five armies, five armies of five Arab countries into that country that just born, it's a baby country, it was just born, they didn't have an army. All they had was this bunch of people from the Holocaust and farmers and if you read stories, I mean, they, they had five tanks that they had taken from the British and one little airplane. And what they used to do is fly the airplane and drop grenades with their hands. 
you know, it's later on in the war that that uh, Czechoslovakia gave them their first plane and, and started that. So there is a beautiful uh, documentary you can find on YouTube. Or it's called Against All Odds, Israel Survives. It's a, it's a, it's a, I have the whole set. It's, a, it's actually a, a journalist who here, an American journalist who heard that there is miracles in Israel Miracles of survival, miracles, military miracles. So he went there as an investigative journalist to record, to collect the stories. And uh, there are several stories from that series. Uh, against all odds, Israel survives. Amazing stories. So, uh, so here we have the, these Jewish folks there. They had five giant armies coming against them. Said, okay, well, let's go to battle. Over. <laughs> you know, and it's still there. They won. I, I would like to add something to this again, something that I mentioned last week. That there were two factions to the Zionist movement, a religious one and a secular one. The religious side of the Zionist movement did not want to create the state of Israel. They said, no, only Messiah can do it. But the secular one says, well, you can wait for Messiah. We'll go in it. And they're the ones who fought these first wars. And I find it amazing that it's actually the seculars who had the faith to do what God said, not the religious people. You know, it's a uh, it's quite a, not the so-called religious fault, religious fault. Until this day, there are sects of intra-Orthodox Jews who do not believe in the state of Israel, and some who even actually work with the enemies of Israel because they believe it's not legitimate, you know. So, but back to our scouts. Sometimes I say spies. Sometimes I say scouts. It's because they were not really spies. They were scouts sent to spy the land. You know, they were really scouts. So our, our scouts had an inferiority complex. In spite of all Hashem had done for them in the desert since they left Egypt, they saw themselves as unworthy of Hashem's big, big life. You know, we can say it's disobedience, we can say it's fear, we can say it's lack of faith, but I think there is also a sense of why should Hashem give us this land and why what should he do this big miracle for us? I personally understand that. And I I come with that from a reading from a book uh, from Zelig Bliskin. He's a Jewish rabbi, psychologist, counselor. And uh, he brings a lot of uh, this stuff from, uh, from Jewish writers. I understand that. You know, it's like uh, there is a country song that says, if you're going through hell, through hell, just keep walking. It might be that you come out to the other side and nobody even knew you there. I don't know if you ever heard that country song. Like this. It's, it's me. That's the way I felt about being in the kingdom. You know, I felt I stumbled into the kingdom. And if I sit on the sides, don't make noise, don't move, nobody will notice that I'm there, probably by mistake. Man. Certainly not. You know, I felt unworthy of God's attention for a long time. Even after I was, uh, after I was uh, saved, I felt that way. It took for me certain realizations that it was not true, you know? So uh, I felt I did not have the right or to, to approach Hashem for difficult things, because I didn't feel I was worth I, I was worthy of it. 
And maybe that's how our spies felt. You know, I had to change that, that attitude. I had to discover it and how I changed it is a story for another day. Maybe a story for Shavuot when we sit all night, and, you know. So, you know this, uh, I want to do a little parenthesis. Uh, we should self, low self-esteem is a real sickness of our time. It's a real, I thought it used to be a teenager's thing, but it's not, you know. And the proliferation of social media has made it amplified. People do crazy things just to get likes on Facebook, on YouTube. How many likes? It's a social status. You know, people do dangerous things to do to, to, on YouTube to, to get to go viral, you know, to get attention of many people. People do ungodly things, perverted things, just to, to draw attention to themselves. Because that's how they understand uh, love. That's how they understand appreciation, acceptance. Yeah, it's very, uh, it's it's very sickening. People will not do the right thing sometimes because it actually it's not popular. It's not popular to do the right thing, to think the right thing, to act the right way. You can oh, you're poo -poo, you know. To, to get the attention of the crowds, you gotta be loud, loud boisterous, dangerous. You gotta, you know, and, and, and it's really, it's really sad. You know, it's, it's really sad, you know, so, but, uh, and when, when people feel like that, their self-esteem, their appreciation of themselves becomes relative to the whims of the of the world around them. Can you imagine when the way you feel about yourself is relative to how many likes you get or the acceptation of people around you? Oh boy, that's really bad. It's actually a form of idolatry because we, we give the control of our person to others instead of to a shell, you know. There is no rest for the person who does that. Yeshua says, you in Luke 16, 15, he says, you people make yourself look righteous to others, but God knows your heart. What people regard highly is an abomination unto God. Ooh. What people regard highly is an abomination to God. You know, so this is the end of my parenthesis on and the, on the self-esteem. So the scouts had maybe an inferiority complex. They didn't feel worthy of God fighting for them, giving them that big prize of this land. You know. To a certain level, <clears throat> I think many of us can relate to that. You know, we may have pride problems, but we also have humility, probably. You know, we can relate to that. So by relating to that, we actually find something that we uh, that we can connect with the spies that we can judge them properly because we can relate to them. We can relate to them in a way that, that well, we're guilty of the same thing sometimes. Sometimes do we, are we, do we have as much faith 
as we should have? Do we believe as much as we should? Do we, you know, usually people don't, you know. So we find something we can associate with it, with this cat. So maybe we can judge them a bit more properly with empathy and compassion. Um, now, about self-esteem. To me, there is one antidote against a low self-esteem with God. I think there is no reason to have low self-esteem with God. Me, if people around me don't like me, of course, I would like them to help me, but at the end of the day, it doesn't change my behavior, it doesn't change my life. You know, it's like, well, too bad. You know, but uh, to feel that God doesn't like us as believers, we have no excuse. You know, the question we should ask ourselves is that <clears throat> how much should a stranger's life be worth for us, for you, to be ready to sacrifice your only child, the one you love for them? Let's say you have one child. This is the only one. You love that child. And his death would save somebody's life. How much would that should that life that you want to save be worth? For it to, to, to be valued enough for you to kill yourself. Right? Well, you understand the question? You know. After we answer this question, we've got to remember that's what God did. And we might say, yeah, well, humanity, maybe, you know. I do believe. Humanity starts with one, with Adam. And if there was, there's a song, Christian song, that says, if, if I were only one, he would have done. Yeah. It's true. Humanity is one person. And when we remember that, we remember that, we should know how much we are worth to God. For us to, to be back in his house, he gave the life of his son. You know, people talk, ah, God, the Lord, Yeshua, grace. No, it's not true. Yeshua and God, they're on the same page. You know, the, the most known verse in the Bible tells us, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever will believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's see. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 15, 16. 16. 16. <laughs> oh, cool. So, <laughs> so, so, you know, it's, it, it's about God, you know. So when we realize how much he wanted to, to be with us, we should, that, that knowledge should give us faith to do anything he asks. Because we are worth a lot to him. We're worth that much. We are worth that sacrifice. So why should we ever deprecate ourselves in his sight? Oh, that knowledge and that faith should give us the faith to do as written of our heroes of faith, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, 
obtained promises. Stop the mouth of lions. Quench the power of fire. Escape the edge of the sword. Were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, putting foreign armies to flight. Women received their death, back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sewn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin, the deprecation that so, so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that it said, said before us, looking to Yeshua, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him Endure the execution stake, despising the shame, and is sitting seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Abba Father, we thank you for the good lessons we can learn um, about the scouts. We are supposed to, put, uh, to, to, to read the stories and take them to heart and learn from them. Help us to know how much you love us and how much we, each one of us, are worthy of your complete and perfect love and attention and of the fulfillment of the great promises you made for those who love you. Shem Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. Okay, well, let's get ready to do some uh, some songs. Okay, so we're going to turn everybody around.